Um, Dr. Cummings has been involved in tobacco control um, policy and research for over 30 years, and I think based on his CV, published his first paper, I think about 30 years ago, on tobacco, on a, on a smoking issue. And his interests are amazingly, well, interests and expertise are amazingly broad. So he's done work on smoking cessation, on um, uh, public perceptions around a, a number of issues. He's done um, uh, tobacco control policy evaluations um, and also interested in the product design. So he's an expert in uh, many domains. He's been, uh, I guess a few years ago, recognized for his contributions to the field th with two very prestigious awards in our field, both the um, John Slade Award from the Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco and then a Luther Terry Award from the American Cancer Society, which are, you know, these are the ultimate awards. And so um, his contributions have been tremendous. And now, um, because of his uh, tremendous expertise, he spends a lot of time on the witness stand and and uh, he's going to talk to us today about litigation and tobacco control. So thank you very much for being here. Raising cigarette taxes, clean indoor air, anti-smoking counter, you know, uh, media campaigns, uh, smoking cessation, uh, all important. And we often leave off the list uh, one of the ways to increase the price of uh, doing business in the tobacco industry, which is uh, litigation. And actually, so, you know, I thought I would do a, a little talk on litigation. I, I, uh, uh, so I'll give you my views on why I think it's important that uh, it's part of tobacco control. It's an important part. It has been a long-standing important part of our effort and uh, will continue to be, uh, as the FDA is certainly learning. And uh, so if you know a lawyer near you, uh, you should get to know them. Uh, make sure they're not working for the other side. Uh, and uh, we'll just sort of get into sort of the role of litigation in tobacco control and, and why litigation is important. And I, I really appreciate being asked to come up here, even though it is APHA, and I know uh, you have a lot of uh, your colleagues who are down in New Orleans, uh, and it is, uh, you know, nicer down there probably than it is up here today. Uh, this is the week of the Great American Smokeout, so the third Thursday in November. Uh, and I think that's how we sort of came up with this date originally, but it was a good thing because I'm still on the witness stand, by the way. They released me to come up today to give this talk to you all, uh, so I'll be flying back to Jacksonville to finish up my testimony, a case down there. But why litigation? And this is right out of the WHO. They did a nice little report in 2002 on the role of litigation, but, you know, we often think of ways of fighting global tobacco epidemic uh, using the methods that I just mentioned, but uh, the law, uh, you know, can awaken public out outrage, strengthen public policies, and redress injuries in the results that advance both justice and health. So litigation is sort of part and parcel of tobacco control, and it's made a huge difference in this country. In fact, there are many examples that I can uh, talk about, but I'll just go through a few that came to my mind as I was, you know, putting these slides together. Equal time for anti-smoking ads on TV, the Fairness Doctrine. Now there we didn't sue tobacco companies there back in the 50s and 60s, you know, three channels on television dominated by the cigarette companies. They were sponsoring about 80 shows, I think, in the, by the mid-19s. Uh, 60s, and a lawyer, uh, actually a law student at the time, John Bansif, uh, sued the Federal you know, uh, Communications Commission f under the Fairness Doctrine for equal time for anti-smoking ads and won that case. And as a result, uh, I'll show you some of the findings from that, but uh, uh, that was a very successful effort of tobacco litigation there against the government. Probably the best known of the recent efforts are the master settlement agreement. This is uh, where actually four states initially sued uh, on behalf of their citizens to get money back for uh, Medicaid expenditures for treating tobacco-related diseases, and uh, those states individually settled their lawsuits, and then the other 46 states, uh, you know, entered into what is referred to as the master settlement agreement. And uh, that reimburse, it reimburses the states for public medical insurance at least uh, not fully $1 for every dollar paid. It's, I think, about 
uh, 10 cents on the dollar that they got back. It was a settlement after all. They didn't uh, actually uh, get a verdict in any of those cases. They were all settled in advance. It did end billboard advertising and print advertising in youth magazines, presumably. Uh, funding of the National Truth Campaign and the Legacy Foundation. It ended the Tobacco Institute and Council for Tobacco Research. And it also caused the release of previously uh, secret uh, business documents from the company. And finally, uh, the, expose of light, uh, the exposure of the fraud of light and low tar cigarettes. That actually, uh, with the first case in 2003, a verdict $10 billion against Philip Morris for marketing two brands, uh, Marlboro Lights, and Cambridge Lights, uh, and Cambridge is an interesting story. It was introduced initially not as a light cigarette, and then when they came out with the light version of Ca Cambridge, um, it was uh, it came out 10 times higher levels of tar and nicotine under the light label. Uh, that was the fraud uh, because they remade Cambridge as a discount brand. And so uh, Marlboro Lights and uh, Cambridge Lights in a courtroom in Illinois actually ended up with a $10, you know, $10 billion verdict against them. And uh, some things happened as a result of that, and I'll share that information with you later. Uh, back in 2004, I was involved with a lawsuit down in Louisiana, the Scott litigation, the class action brought, up, brought on behalf of injured smokers. Uh, they were looking for treatment uh, reimbursement for addiction as well as medical monitoring. They lost on medical monitoring. They won on cessation. It uh, was uh, litigated uh, through appeals. Uh, the $600 million verdict ended up now as a billion dollars in the bank account as the interest accrued uh, during the appeals process. And now, believe it or not, in Louisiana, they actually have a million dollar fund to pay for smoking cessation treatment for members of the eligible class of individuals who were uh, primarily smokers during the 1990s. And then, of course, the DOJ racketeering case. Uh, we're still waiting for the corrective statements to come out, but uh, maybe someday we're going to see that. Overall, I think the uh, range of litigation that we've seen, and I'll tell you a lot about the individual litigation going on, but I think it's affected the price of cigarettes. The master settlement agreement just right off the bat was a 45 cent increase in the you know, cost of a pack of cigarettes. And it's uh, certainly changed public perceptions about the tobacco industry, and so those things have changed. So let's start off with the fairness doctrine and, uh, you know, the uh, legal petition sent to the Federal Communications Commission, and that resulted in these anti-smoking ads appearing on television during a very brief time period between 1967 and 19. Uh, 70, it corresponds to a period where 16 million Americans actually quit smoking. Now, in the courtroom, by the way, the industry always talks about it was the caution label that uh, appeared in 1966. They said that's what's driving smoking rates down. Uh, it's interesting uh, that they argue that they don't ever mention the anti-smoking ads that are going on television. Uh, but, you know, there was an FTC report, the first of the reports that came out on cigarette advertising, it's worth reading, in 1967, uh, that uh, talked about the caution label having virtually had no effect because cigarette sales actually went up after they put the caution, which, you know, just told smokers it may be hazardous to your health. They call it a warning. It never said warning. It said caution. Cigarette smoking may be dangerous to your health. It never attributed it to a Surgeon General. The Surgeon General's attribution wasn't until 1970. Anyway, back in the, you know, before, you see these ads on television. This was the early Marlboro, uh, 1954 vintage, which I always find interesting. So before the Marlboro man, we had Marlboro dad. Yeah, so that's uh, 1956, actually, when they did that ad. You know, we put that up, ad up on YouTube, and uh, Philip Morris uh, wrote to YouTube and said, take it down. Uh, and they did, unfortunately. But, you know, it's just uh, 
Uh, I guess they didn't like that. But in 1967, this is actually the counter message in the Fairness Doctrine. So it's one of the like ads that they ran. Like son. <laughs> That was the Heart Association that did that ad. Yeah. So that was one of the ads. They actually had three. The Lung Association had one, and then I think the Cancer Society did the William Tallman ad. You know, William Tallman was the sidekick in Perry Mason. He was the district attorney who always lost the cases, had lung cancer, sort of like a Ewell Brenner type ad that they did a few years later. Very successful, those campaigns. So. Um, now, what about the individual litigation? It hasn't been so easy. You know, it's easy to sue the government. It's a little harder to sue the tobacco companies. And you go back and actually date the first uh, lawsuit filed against the cigarette companies in the United States was 1954. And there have been multiple other cases filed between 1954 and the 70s, all ending in defense verdicts, uh, by the way. And so very few cases were filed during the 70s that actually went on to trial. So while there might have been efforts to try to sue, the tobacco companies, uh, really uh, very few, uh, you know, no success whatsoever. I, it is interesting, though, uh, a couple of these cases, uh, the one here, I think it was, uh, uh, as I was doing research, uh, the uh, Latrigue trial was, uh, you know, because I was at Roswell Park for 31 years, and I was going through the records, and the director of Roswell Park in 1960 was the key witness, it turns out, in that particular trial. Uh, and uh, so there's a history of people stepping up to the plate. That was the head of a cancer center who was actually a witness in, a can you know, in these trials dating back. But no verdicts uh, back then. And, you know, the industry, they have an army of lawyers out there, and uh, they, they still have an army, and they you know, make it very hard to uh, get a little justice. They punish those who threaten them, and they are particularly threatened when it means money out of their pocket. So they are willing to spend an enormous amount of money uh, litigating against uh, the, anybody who threatens them. So this is actually a, a memo was written uh, back in 1988 uh, from some lawsuits that have been filed out in California where they said to paraphrase, paraphrase uh, General Patton, the way we won these cases was not by spending all of Reynolds' money, but by making that other son of a bitch spend all of his. And that's basically been their strategy to outspend, outmaneuver uh, plaintiffs' uh, attorneys, uh, and they've been highly successful because uh, we didn't start winning any cases really until uh, the late 1980s, early 90s. Uh, and even there, most of those cases ended up as uh, defense verdicts, uh, usually thrown out of court, or if they went to trial, they, they got a defense verdict. Uh, but we were getting some interesting things. And actually, Merrill Williams is sort of indicated in the center there, because he was a paralegal that was hired by Brown and Williamson. And uh, he was a smoker. He was also a sick smoker. He had heart problems and was going to have heart surgery. And he started stuffing some of the interesting documents in his pants as he left the office uh, as he was in there, three-story tall document depository at Brown and Williamson in Louisville, and uh, made a few copies. And they got sent to the New York Times. That's the cigarette papers, by the way. Uh, and it provided a roadmap for everything that came after. So you usually need a whistleblower to help, and Merrill was the whistleblower. Uh, and uh, so he's sort of the unsung hero in a lot of the documents. In 1992, a lawsuit was filed against uh, Lorillard Tobacco Company. This is uh, Milton Horowitz. 
Uh, it was over the Kemp Micronite filter. So this is actually one of the first victories that we saw in litigation. The Kemp Micronite cigarette, you know, we've all heard of Kemp Micronite and the Kemp cigarettes. It's been around, one of the first filtered brands introduced uh, in this country, 1952. Uh, but uh, between 1952 and 1956, the filter was made out of chrysidolite asbestos. And uh, so that was a problem because the Micronite filter made of the pure dust-free material that is so safe, so effective, it's been selected to help filter the air of hospital operating rooms. And the problem was you could find the asbestos in the lungs of these people. So Milton didn't actually have lung cancer. He had mesothelioma. Uh, he had no other evidence of exposure. There are a couple of other ca cases that have been filed along the lines. See, by the time we get to 1992, and we've had all the asbestos litigation that's already gone on, um, you know, it was hard to find. Milton, by the way, was a, uh, was a psychologist. It wasn't like he was working in the shipyards or as a plumber where he might have been occupationally exposed to asbestos. And, uh, and they ended up, uh, this is the Madeline Chaber, who was the attorney, and Ray Goldstein, who was the paralegal who dug up uh, the internal documents on the Micronite filter, most of which, by the way, had been destroyed. Uh, by Laurelard Tobacco, but they got a jury verdict. This is one of the first, about a million dollars, uh, and uh, uh, you know, punitive damages uh, against both Laurelard and uh, also the uh, Hollingsworth and Voss, which was uh, one of the distributors of the chrysidolite asbestos, and uh, they actually had to pay in 1998. So, lawsuit filed 1992, six years. You know, sort of gives you an idea of the process, uh, you know, where the attorneys, the plaintiff's attorneys sort of make their money when they get paid finally. They don't get it up front like the defense attorneys. Uh, you know, the industry public image has been sullied over time. So, you know, of course we saw in 1994. So in 92, we finally have a victory against the companies. In 92, we have these guys saying, you know, cigarettes aren't addictive. And um, that really changed things quite a bit. So just to remind you Let historically. Let me begin my questioning on the matter of uh, whether or not nicotine is addictive. Let me ask you first, and I'd like to just go down the row, uh, whether each of you believe uh, that nicotine is not addictive. I heard virtually all of you touch on it, and just yes or no. Do you believe nicotine is not addictive? I believe nicotine is not addictive, yes. Mr. Johnson. Uh, Congressman. Cigarettes and nicotine clearly do not meet the classic definitions of addiction. There is no right. intoxication. We'll, we'll take that as a no, and again, time is short. If you could just, I think each of you believe nicotine is not addictive. We just would like to have this for the record. I don't believe that nicotine or our products are addictive. I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. I do believe that nicotine is not addictive. So here's a quiz. How many, how many of these guys still work for a cigarette company? Anybody have an answer? Zero. Yep, they, they left shortly after their appearance in front of uh, Congress uh, where they perjured themselves, of course. Uh, but that had a big effect and uh, really opened the door because I think public anger, uh, you know, was really created and... Uh, Thanks to Ron Motley and Dick Scruggs and Mike Moore, they conjured up a scheme to try to get around individual uh, personal choice arguments that were made by the companies in all the individual litigation. And in the mid-90s, uh, with four states, Florida, Mississippi, Texas, and Minnesota, uh, there were individual suits filed against the cigarette companies for uh, to recoup public insurance costs from selling uh, cigarettes that cause us to have to pay for all these, you know, Medicaid expenses, essentially. All four of those cases uh, ended up in settlements, and the initial settlement was Mississippi. Then they went to Texas. Uh, I think MD Anderson, by the way, collected up like $100 million or something, uh, not seeing how much they spend on tobacco control from that, but they got a lot of money as a result of that. And then Florida uh, settled, and then they actually went to court in Minnesota, and they you know, went through a full trial, and I guess the companies were a little nervous, and they settled in Minnesota before the jury could come back with their verdict in that particular case. And then there were other cases that had gone on 
Uh, almost all the other states had joined on in the litigation. Some communities, Los Angeles, uh, all the uh, counties in New York, because the counties actually split the Medicaid expenditures, had joined. And uh, they ended up with the master settlement agreement uh, between the 46 states. And I described a little bit about what that did. But the main thing it did is in order to pay the $245 billion that were part of the you know, payout from the agreement, the cigarette companies merely increased the price of a package of cigarettes about 45 cents. Uh, and that resulted in a reduction in consumption at that time of about 21%. So that's pretty good tobacco control if you can think of it that way. So forget all the youth ads and all the other things that went on. Just raising the price makes a big difference. Um, now those pesky little tobacco documents got released as a result of that. Thankfully in Minnesota they created the depository up there. And then in Washington when they were settling that case, and that's where they did the big master settlement, uh, that case was actually underway at the same time that Minnesota had settled. Uh, they agreed to turn over all the documents, put them up on a public website. So the original websites that the companies put up were all uh, individually created by each company, impossible to search because the creation across companies, because they designed it so it was hard to do searching on any one company website. Uh, and then, of course, there was the Tobacco Institute and the Council for Tobacco Research. These were the fraudulent organizations that were really the fronts and the shields for the tobacco companies. That's what their documents say, at least, front and shield. And uh, those were in paper form because they just shut down the offices. And interestingly enough, there was a little side agreement to that in New York State uh, because the Tobacco Industry Research Committee, which was created in 1953 as a result of the Plaza Hotel meeting in, in uh, New York where the conspiracy began, um, they uh, uh, incorporated in New York State. They later became known as the Council for Tobacco Research, same organization. The Tobacco Institute spun out of that group in 1958. Their offices were in Bethesda, but they were originally incorporated in New York State, in New York City, actually. And in fact, Hill and Knowlton, which was the public relations company that you know helped the cigarette companies put out you know the original stuff with TIRC, they were located in the Empire State Plaza building, and TIRC was one floor below, so they were part and parcels, essentially run by a public relations firm. So, in late 1998, right around the time of the settlement, I get a call from the New York State Attorney General. He says, "We got all these tobacco documents. Do you want them?" So this is the basement of Roswell Park. I said yes, didn't know what I was getting into. Um, and I said, bring them all at once, because I figured they'd try to pull stuff out. Uh, that was impossible. They refused to do that. Turns out they had down here in Washington, the offices of Covington and Burling had a warehouse, and they had an army of about you know, 100 paralegals going through every page to decide what they would turn over to us. We got the copies of stuff, but they were shipped up. Every two weeks, we would get a, you know, these pallets would come in, uh, multiple ones. It was like a moving van every two weeks arriving. And I rented an off-space facility. We would process the stuff. We had a couple of high-speed scanners. I employed the library students at UB for about seven years. They created the digital index for this. And we created the index that allowed uh, the UCSF library, actually, to figure out how you could spider all the documents across all the websites. Um, OCR was coming in. It didn't really exist at that time. We had some good computer technology people that helped us OCR the documents so you could actually do key phrases. And all of a sudden, you could put context and create collections. And uh, so those pesky documents were a little bit of a problem because, uh, you know, this is what, you know, had been the big issue for the cigarette companies in these individual litigation cases while we got the master settlement. We never won a verdict, actually. And uh, we can't defend con you know, continued smoking as free choice if the person is addicted. You know, you can't write this stuff any better. Uh, so, uh, and there's plenty of stuff. And we put together the material. And it really has served as the basis for the litigation that has now gone on. So as these documents began to you know, percolate out, we had Pat Henley here. She filed a suit. This is Madeline, who's out in California. So a lot of the early lawsuits were some pretty 
uh, fabulous uh, plaintiff's attorneys who really took on, you know, Goliath uh, in their efforts uh, to try to, you know, get a little justice. This lady, of course, died during the course of the trial because she had uh, lung cancer, but we have a nice picture of Pat there. But they, in 2001, did get a verdict uh, in that case against uh, Philip Morris for defective product, failure to warn, negligence. You know, once you see the story laid out in, in the documents in their own words, there's just no denying that these guys are as you know, guilty as sin, basically. And uh, you know, the Henley verdict ended up with $15 million. A jury awarded $50 million in punitive damages. Punitive is the damages you pay because you have to be punished to change your behavior. So that's a lot of money. Uh, 50 million is a lot of money. The judge reduced it. He saw that was maybe too much, so he reduced it to half of that, 25 million. So you know the total here is a 40 million dollar verdict. 15 compensatory for pain and suffering and dying prematurely, and uh, and then the uh, 25 million. And the judges have some discretion there. Of course, that got appealed. And uh, there's a lot of appeals that go on. You'll see the end result of that appeal in a second. But you know, after 2000, the documents are out there. And now you can see, my gosh, there's a lot more cases being filed. And we're actually winning. That's the green dots in these cases and fewer red dots that are there. These cases often go on for years. Uh, and some of them are continuing to go on. But we're beginning to win more of the cases because the documents tell a story. In 2000, we had Richard Boykin. His suit was filed. Now, he was, you know, Richard, like a lot of people, you know, had other substance use problems. Uh, he was a cocaine addict for a good period of his life, overcame that, by the way, died of lung cancer from cigarette smoking. The jury, uh, Mike Pughes, by the way, was his attorney and it was one of the, the lead guys, uh, uh, you know, in the early litigation against the companies. And he got a, about a $5 million compensatory verdict. $3 billion in punitive damages and uh, reduced, uh, by the way, to uh, $100 million. Uh, and so that looked like a pretty good case for a you know, recovering cocaine addict. Of course, he doesn't get to spend any of this money because he's long since dead uh, as a result of the, the lung cancer that came along. And it took a while to get that. Betty Bullock is another one, uh, 2001. That was also Mike Pugh's. Uh, and you can see when the, the judge and juries get to see the evidence, how just startled they are. This is right from the judge's uh, uh, report on the case. He said, the jury found with substantial evidentiary support that Philip Morris' conduct was reprehensible and a substantial award of punitive damages is necessary to have a deterrent effect. And uh, in fact, Philip Morris in this case put on one witness uh, and, you know, that one witness offered no evidence to counteract the conspiracy that had led to uh, the death of that, uh, you know, uh, mother and grandmother uh, of lung cancer. Um, $850,000 verdict, a $28 billion punitive damage. I, mean, I think we heard probably this summer the big, you know, verdict in Florida, $23 billion. You know, how could that happen? Well. This is in uh, uh, early 2000, I think 2002, when we got this particular verdict. So as the juries were beginning to see the evidence, uh, they were coming back. They got it when it came to punitive damages, because when you look at the amount of money these companies make, you got to have a big number. The judge reduced it to $28 million, and uh, uh, that was unfortunate. But of course, that would not deter the companies from appealing. So what happened in 2002? Well, there was another case. This is State Farm versus Campbell. State Farm being an insurance company, Campbell was an injured uh, driver, insured by State Farm, and uh, they, I guess, hadn't acted in a responsible way, and they got a large punitive uh, damages award, and so th this got appealed up to the Supreme Court of the United States, and the court basically determined that the punitive damages should be based on degree of reprehensibility, but you know it has to be within reason, and unfortunately, uh, in uh, practice, few awards exceeding a single-digit ratio is what they came up as within region. So the Supreme Court hasn't been particularly friendly to the you know taking big corporations, 
tobacco, if you can't sue tobacco, better worry about what you're going to do with the oil industry and global warming and the pharma industry and insurance fraud because they're nothing compared to tobacco. You've got 100 million people who've died in the 20th century as a result of tobacco. And uh, so punitive damages, unfortunately, here's the Henley case. They ended up uh, finally paying off and it got reduced to 9 million. Uh, and I can go through the other cases, you got similar reductions, and we're still fighting the punitive damage issue uh, from Campbell versus State Farm. So what about the litigation, the light litigation that I previewed you about? Light litigation, Price Miles, this was the case in 2003 with a $10 billion verdict, uh, which was overturned on appeal. We lost two to three, uh, so we got one, one judge with us. Uh, and the deciding vote in that case was a judge who used to work for a cigarette company law firm, uh, and he didn't recuse himself. That has now come back this year, by the way. They've reinstated the verdict, and now it's going back through the appeal process. So in 2003, but it is interesting, things did change, because in 2003, that's the pack of Marlboro Light cigarettes, low tar, lower in tar and nicotine. That was the fraud. They set it right on the pack they advertised, you get lower tar and fraud, you know, lower tar and nicotine, which in their internal documents and all the research we now know, does you don't get less tar and nicotine uh, at all. And they removed it right after 2003. And now, of course, we've gone from Marlboro Lights to Marlboro Goals. Uh, and uh, so the fraud has sort of been uh, articulated out there. All the real fraud of light cigarettes is the filter vents in the product, which, by the way, filter vents in a cigarette make the product, make the tar that comes out the end more mutagenic. Uh, that's not a good thing. That's sort of the first step in where we're going with cancer and mutagenicity testing, if you do Ames testing and so on. The tar that you get from a filter vented cigarette and the degree of filter ventilation is directly uh, related to the scores you get on mutagenicity testing. Known to the companies back in the 80s, back in the 90s, it's a standard part of their testing, and filter vents exist on virtually every product out there today, uh, except for just a handful that aren't vented. The Scott litigation I mentioned, that took, uh, we had the 2004 verdict. In 2012, they finally started to recruit people. Of course, the sad part of this, most of the case was for people who were smokers in the 1990s, many of whom had died or quit smoking on their own, so never will ever get the benefit of uh, the Scott litigation, this money that they have, but they finally have a, a system. Interestingly enough, in the appeals on this case, they got the judge to agree that uh, you couldn't advertise to class members to call to get into the program. So sort of crazy, you have this program, but you can't tell people about it. So uh, now they're working systems through some of the electronic health records and other groups who are fronting for them to let people know how they get into the class. But it's a, you know, you should have been having full page ads and TV spots and so on telling people to call this number. They've not been allowed to do that. Uh, and then of course the verdict in 2006 with the DOJ, uh, all those pesky little documents Here's the deal with DOJ, why they're racketeers. They got together at the Plaza Hotel. They had a conspiracy to deceive the American public. They told the Department of Justice, they wrote to Stanley Barnes, the Assistant uh, Attorney General of the United States in January of 1954. We've met at the Plaza Hotel. We you know, have this program of research that we're creating called the Tobacco Industry Research Committee. And the limits of our powers, it's right in the Articles of Incorporation, says the only thing that we will do is we will uh, basically do research on smoking and health and we'll provide factual information to the public. Well, I can tell you that's not the only thing they did. They did special projects where the lawyers selected the scientists. They used those scientists as the mouthpiece to say there was a controversy and so on going on for the whole period of, in which that organization existed. Uh, Judge uh, Gladys uh, Kessler got that, and that's why they were guilty of conspiring and found guilty under the RICO charge. And unfortunately, uh, prior to that case, they eliminated any economic damages. This was supposed to be the other part of the uh, money paid out, which was the Medicaid 
paid from our federal contributions that we make on our taxes. Uh, that was taken off the table. So what they ended up with is corrective statements that's gone through various appeals. So, uh, but it, you know, sometime soon, maybe we'll see ads like this that what, where they're finally going to have to acknowledge that they lied about mm -hmm. uh, the nicotine and the light and low tar and the other things about their product. Uh, in the early 1990s, uh, there was another set of cases that happened, uh, and of course you've got a family a research center here at Hopkins, uh, and uh, this was the flight attendant's effort to try to get clean indoor air as an occupational part of airline, uh, the, the airline's Patty Young was the person who was really the prime individual sort of pushing that along. Um, and uh, in uh, 1997, that actually went to trial. That was the first case I ever testified live at was the Bruin case. And uh, um, they got a settlement. And they were, you know, back in those days, it was, you know, the MSA was out there. Actually, there was some discussion. The McCain bill was out there. And they thought they were going to just settle all of these cases and put them out of reach. And so they sort of tucked this one away with Stanley and Susan Rosenblatt. Uh, and they, even though we were doing the trial, they decided they would settle it uh, rather than uh, uh, go through and get a verdict from the jury. And uh, uh, so what was the agreement? Well, the agreement was the creation of a research fund. They basically said, Do, you cannot give a dime to any flight attendant. They get no money for medical expenses or anything. You can create this, you know, research fund and, uh, and then, of course, the lawyers, it was $350 million, which, you know, isn't insignificant. And there was a part of that was the payment back to the lawyers, who, by the way, had filed a, uh, another uh, lawsuit uh, at the same time they did the, the Bruin case, which was the flight attendant case. And that was the Howard Engel case. Howard Engel was a, a physician, a friend of uh, Susan and Stanley's. And they filed a class action on behalf of all injured smokers in Florida in the early 90s, right around that same time. Broin went first. Stanley just didn't take the money they collected from the Broin settlement, which was a substantial number of millions of dollars in their pocket. Uh, what he did was he bankrolled that uh, to fund what became the longest running, still today, civil trial in American history. It went on for 18 months. Imagine being on that jury, 18 months every day. You got to come into the courtroom. Uh, and uh, uh, they had, you know, uh, did this case, you know, for between 1998 and it finally ended in 2000. Uh, and that's the courtroom uh, during the 18 months. And uh, I, that's the, actually the banner that was above the judge. Uh, you know, we who labor here seek only truth. There were no tobacco documents. There were a few, but not a whole lot. It wasn't like the wave of documents that we now have available for these cases. He really just did it. He had Ron Davis, who was former director of the Office on Smoking and Health. Uh, Dave Sudransky here from, uh, uh, from Johns Hopkins testified. Uh, you had uh, uh, Julie Richmond, former Surgeon General, testified in the case. Um, he'd have a new witness every day, basically, he would come in. It was quite stark uh, to see the army of attorneys literally on one side of the courtroom, and then they'd have some of the Engel class members on the other side, uh, you know, a guy in the wheelchair that was wheeled in every day, somebody else, you know, coughing through their trach tube uh, there. And then Stanley and his paralegal, Susan did all the legal briefs behind because every day they would have opposition and they'd have to respond. This went on for, for over 18 months. And amazingly, they got a verdict of $145 billion. So, you know, $28 billion is a lot of money, but $145 billion, that's a lot of money. And that would have bankrupt the companies and we were done in 19, you know, basically early 2000 with that verdict. Um, and uh, in Florida at the time, there were no laws that said, you know, we have either caps and all that. They created a law, by the way, as a result of the Engel trial, and they went back and grandfathered the Engel case in, and uh, because we would have bankrupt the companies and could have created the change uh, right then and there. Uh, it was appealed. It went through the Supreme Court in 2006. Uh, basically, they took the verdict away. They held all the findings of the original jury that thankfully, you know, they sat there for 18 months and did all that work and came up with the findings. 
but they basically said you have to prove each individual who's a class member whether they're addicted to nicotine and whether their nicotine addiction caused their disease. They're, you know. And uh, as a result of that, there's a tidal wave of cases that started to go to trial in 2008. Over 8,000 cases are filed in the state of Florida. And uh, so I've been pretty busy uh, recently because there are a lot of these cases. I think about 150 of them have actually gone to trial at this point. Uh, and uh, Engel Progeny update, you know, they say more than 500. This is from uh, Wall Street, I think. Uh, Morgan Stanley uh, thing, and they track the, uh, the lawsuits and so on. Uh, and what you see is that we're getting uh, a pretty you know, stable win-loss uh, rate, about 60%, a little over 60% victories for the plaintiffs. So, so far we've collected about a billion dollars in uh, payoffs. And some of these cases, by the way, have been paid off. They've actually had to pay the money. Uh, in fact, there are so many cases going on now, they actually have trading cards that they've created for some of the attorneys. This is Stephanie Parker. She's at Jones Day. They represent R.J. Reynolds. I saw Stephanie uh, a week ago Sunday. She came in to depose me from Jones Day, and they keep track of their verdicts, win-loss records, and so on. And so it's an honor, I guess, to get a trading card after yourself, but to show you just how much has gone on. Uh, this is uh, Benny Martin. You know, Benny uh, uh, died of lung cancer, and his wife Hildy here, you can see uh, below with her attorneys. Uh, this was one of the first cases that actually got tried, uh, and in 2012, it got tried all the way, all the appeals through the you know, various Florida courts up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court, fortunately, chose not to listen to this case. They dismissed it, upheld the lower court rulings. That meant the, the verdict stands. You got to slip the check under the door. There was a date and a time by which that check had to be slipped under the door, and it was slipped under the door at 11.59 p.m. on that date. So they did it legally, but at the very, you know, they're just sending a message uh, as to what to do. But that was $28 uh, million, a, you know, reasonable verdict there. But of course, this is what the companies say about all this litigation. We would like to see the industry, particularly, you know, Reynolds, given its experience, uh, you know, sort of just work this into the price of a pack of cigarettes, and it has. You know, one of the reasons that the price of cigarettes keeps going up um, is you got to satisfy those stockholders who just have an insatiable desire for more money every quarter, uh, and uh, you got to pay the bills along the way. So the cost of doing business for the tobacco companies has gone up. Most of the litigation is against Reynolds, by the way. Reynolds bought Brown and Williamson, American Tobacco, so Paul Mall, Lucky Strike, they're a part of Reynolds. Uh, you know, now we have Brown and Williamson with Cool. These were sort of the old time brands that were pretty popular for a period of time, plus Camel Cigarettes, of course, and Winston. They pretty much aged out at this point. Uh, but they have a much higher litigation risk than Laurelard and Philip Morris because their brands came a little later. You know, Philip Morris, you know, Marlboro really was a brand that took off in the 60s and became the popular brand. So while there are cases against Philip Morris, most of them, uh, Reynolds has a much bigger payout for this, which Philip Morris is very happy about, by the way. That gives them an advantage. Now, you know, the Florida stuff keeps going on. I don't know where it's all going to end, but this was a verdict this summer. Uh, so I didn't count among the mil you know, billion dollars uh, so far the $23 billion verdict. So every once in a while, the juries get angry. And this was a verdict in Pensacola, not like the bastion of, uh, it's not like you're in Miami with the juries are a little bit more liberal and open to hear this. Uh, and you know, Pensacola is a pretty conservative place. But when conservative folks or liberal folks hear about what these companies did to lie to these consumers, how they've manipulated their products, they get pretty angry. And um, so we'll see, obviously, what will happen uh, with that. Of course, this was the comment back from R.J. Reynolds. They said, you know, the verdict goes far beyond the realm of re reasonableness and fairness and is completely inconsistent with the evidence presented. That's their usual statement. And uh, it's not inconsistent. It's a reasonable verdict. The jury actually got it right. Now, they probably will not come near to ever collecting anything uh, close to the amount that's there. Um, and in fact, I'm sure they'll demand a new trial as a result. Uh, 
but they will not pay that person. And they could very reasonably say, okay, we'll just give you a million bucks and go away. And it could be done with all these cases very simply. It would save them a lot more money. Instead, it's like slipping the check under the door at 1159. They're going to fight to the death and never admit any wrongdoing whatsoever, which they've never done. So the industry, they have a lot of lawyers, as I pointed out, and they're going after the FDA at this point, and this is their strategy with FDA. So, you know, if you're in the tobacco control business, this is where the thing sort of the rubber hits the road is dealing with litigation. So, of course, we've had, uh, I think this was the verdict uh, uh, on the warning labels, but we've had, uh, you know, with e-cigarettes and a whole variety and just anticipate whatever the FDA does is going to be in court. And they, in fact, even, I, unfortunately, the, the notice here, there's a conference in January I guess it must be a secret conference because it didn't copy on my slide. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is the agenda, you know, discussing deeming regs and pre-market approval uh, and even the you know, best practices for the Engel litigation. So the law firm of, uh, I think it's Latham and Watkins is the law firm in New York or in uh, here in Washington that's sponsoring this uh, coming up in January. It's worth going to sort of see, you know, what they're talking about and what the issues are going to be because, you know, the first four of them are directly aimed at what's going on at the FDA. Because there's a lot of these new products. These are sort of the old-time versions, you know, e-cigarettes we hear about. And so, you know, Joanna originally asked me to talk about e-cigarettes, but I figured I'd do litigation. I think it's a lot more interesting. But, the, you know, the first e-cigarette was really, really premier. It was a product that didn't burn tobacco. In fact, it didn't even heat tobacco. It heated uh, nicotine and glycerin beads in a metal tube wrapped in a uh, little bit of tobacco and paper. Uh, that was premier in, in the late 90s. And then we have, you know, Philip Morris is a core. This is the, the heat uh, not burn cigarettes that they're now touting as their new savior, savior for harm reduction. We've had Areva tablets, the tobacco tablets out there. Uh, we've had nicotine straws. That quite didn't make it, but uh, another version. And, of course, you know, some pharmacies are selling lollipops with nicotine. Um, and Reynolds helps to spin out nicotine through their new company called Targacept. Nicovarum is now selling FDA-approved nicotine gum. Uh, you know, so it's smokeless, ashless, nicotineless, tarless, you know, paperless, tobaccoless, cigarettes. Uh, and, um, you know, <laughs> you wonder what you're getting next. Not anymore. Now I can smoke as much as I like. Now that I got the lung brush. Lung brush? <laughs> That's right. Lung brush. Created by a small inventor in California who himself enjoyed smoking. Lung brush is the easy, inexpensive alternative to quitting or cutting down. Here's how it works. Taking hold of the easy grip handle, slide the gentle bristle device past the tracheal opening, back down the windpipe, and into the lung itself. The unique lung brush design allows you to remove caked on tar, smoke particles, even city smog phlegm. Freeing up clogged bronchial passages so vital for breathing and smoking. And lung brush's sturdy design makes cleaning and maintenance a snap. One lung brush may be the only lung brush you'll ever need. Here's football great Kenny Stabler. I threw my light and low tar cigarettes away. Now I'm back to my favorite brand again. Thanks, lung brush. Time to come to bed, dear. <coughs> Don't forget to brush. Lung brush, that is. So get into the lung brush habit today and smoke to your heart's content. Lung brush is available wherever quality tobacco products are sold. Only $14.95 from Life Tool. Well, there you go. We don't know what's coming next, but, uh, you know, let's not forget the MSA. Just a few points here because the litigation out there, remember the MSA had the money coming to the states. And, you know, there were these MSA violators that were the companies that were part of the conspiracy and so on. So those are the participating manufacturers. And then they had a, a lot of these little companies that got spun off. They weren't really part of the original conspiracy. They called them the non-participating group. And the laws that got passed in all the states were that you had to enforce a collection of escrow funds from the non-participating manufacturers. So in South Carolina, we have hundreds of manufacturers, and they incorporate on day one of the year, and they go out of business on day 364. And then they reincorporate under a different name in, uh, on day three, 365 of the year. So they technically, 
don't have to pay the escrow amount. This is happening in all kinds of states. And uh, the cigarette companies, they have a lot of, you know, gall, I guess I will say, because uh, they sued the states uh, for not collecting the escrow on the non-participating manufacturers, which is a requirement in terms of paying out the MSA funds every year. So in 2013, the cigarette industry received a windfall of money from a handful of states who settled, because they really hadn't done a very good job tracking down the non-participating manufacturers. That was for the year 2003 payments only. It was over a billion dollars collected back. That's what they got last year. They are going back and they're going to do it for 2004, 2005. So these companies are already collecting back Payments on the books that have to be paid out are now coming back to them. And uh, that means the price of cigarettes, the cost of doing business is a little less this year than it was last year. And that's not a good thing because we like to keep the price of cigarettes high. Now, some towns are taking on the tobacco comp you know, companies. This is, I guess, last week in Massachusetts, uh, Westminster, the one little town they have, you know, uh, the Board of Health proposed banning the sale of cigarettes. And I mention this because uh, we had a firestorm. I guess the Board of Health had to shut down their meeting uh, because people were, I guess, upset that, uh, you know, there was talk of banning the sale of cigarettes. I think it would be fine to say ban the sale of combustible tobacco products and see what they might do because all the cigarette companies pretty much have these alternative products. Uh, so they don't have to be selling the ones that kill one out of two of the users. In fact, it's quite interesting today that you can get away doing that, that you have products on the market uh, that, uh, you know, aren't as deadly and you can sell the deadly ones. Uh, that really doesn't make sense from any litigation perspective. But, you know, Dave Sutton, you know, from Richmond, you know, when he's talking about this proposal, he says it's bad policy, it will harm of course, the poor are local employers. You know, we believe the business should be able to choose which products they carry, regardless of whether, they, whether they're defective and kill the customers. Cigarettes are not just dangerous, they're un unreasonably dangerous. Uh, and uh, of course, they lump in the e-vapor as part of this, so, uh, which probably shouldn't be. So we go back to 1954, where we started with litigation. This is what they promised the American people. They said, we put the public's health above all other um, you know, uh, people's health as a basic responsibility of paramount to every other consideration of our business. Of course, they claimed up until 2000, it was October of 2000 when Philip Morris changed their website. Uh, there's nothing, by the way, if you look at a pack of Philip Morris cigarettes, says don't litter uh, on it. So please don't litter. That's an instruction, I guess, they give to customers. There's nothing that, they don't provide an instruction that says don't inhale. Uh, they don't uh, put an instruction on that says, you know, you could get addicted to this product. Uh, when Philip Morris bought Liggett brands, Lark and Eve cigarettes, and those cigarettes were sold with a warning label uh, that said cigarettes are addictive, a voluntary label that Liggett had put on, Philip Morris not only let those products sell out, they went to the store, took them off the shelf, destroyed them and put on their, you know, Lark and Eve cigarettes that uh, did, did not carry the warning. So that's who you're dealing with. And so, you know, the litigation story, I think, has got a long way to go. Uh, Canada, i just point out, each of the provinces in Canada have sued the major cigarette manufacturers in Canada. I think in Ontario is my understanding of that case has gone all the way through the trial, it went to a judge panel, sort of like the DOJ case, and a decision is due, maybe, any day, I guess. And that could be another one of these events, like $145 billion, where these companies could be bankrupt. And let's hope that we don't follow the story of sort of letting them find the trap door in the floor and letting them come out at the other end. So anyway, thanks for your time and attention. Be happy to answer any questions. I think there are microphones on each side uh, because they asked you to speak into the microphones since I guess they're filming this. So. Test. Thanks for your talk. Uh, can I 
can we imagine a case, um, a person who smoked uh, cigarettes from different companies and then suffered um, a, di a disease related to, to smoking, and um, who, which company should take responsibility? In? That's a great question, and we have many of these cases that I'm involved with, these Engel cases, because people switch brands. They might start with one company's brand and then move on to another. And basically, it's up to the jury to decide the proportion of responsibility. So there's this concept in the law course called proportional risk. So it's not an all or one, all or none kind of thing. Some of that proportional risk could be due to the individual plaintiff. You should have known better, or you did know better at a certain time. And so the jury can weigh that, as well as each of the companies. And uh, so, you know, they divide it up. So whatever the damage award, if they get damage awards, uh, you know, if they assume that 10% is due to the plaintiff, that's sort of subtracted from the award. And then, you know, 10% is Reynolds and 70% is Philip Morris. That's how it's done. And it's really, usually for a jury, just think if you were sitting there as a juror, how you'd figure it out, you'd probably look at, well, what is the evidence in about the number of years that person used that brand? And that's usually the way it ends up. Oh, I don't. I'm just holding the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, oh uh, first, you thank, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. So the uh, I was wondering, and I'm sorry if this is a little bit off topic, but do you see this happening with mm, big food, big uh, like Coke, like um, McDonald's, like uh, all of these other companies that have products that uh, harm uh, people yeah. and that uh, get great benefits because of it. Sure. I, I do see it happening, hopefully not with me involved. Uh, um, you know, tobacco is a unique issue because the cigarette, you know, when used as intended by the manufacturer will kill you. So I think that's a little different than you have with some of the other products. But I think the Tobacco uh, litigation story is one to look at carefully in public health because those internal business records, I mean, really, we didn't see anything happen on an individual liability basis until those documents became available. Uh, and the same could easily be true. And particularly since many of the companies like Kraft and uh, General Foods, Nabisco, they were all owned at one time by cigarette companies. There's great documents on high fructose corn syrup that was invented by R.J. Reynolds scientists for top dressing and then got utilized uh, in the early 70s in the use of, uh, I think it was Nabisco product or Kraft, it's one of those. Uh, so there are some interesting documents among you for those of you who are interested in nutrition and, uh, and of course the flavor data, um, you know, is very interesting and the cigarette companies, you know, had meetings where they were meeting with experts looking at flavors appealing to kids uh, even though they were just there to learn about flavors, not, not about, you know, marketing to kids, that they were getting from studies that were being done by the food manufacturers who were owned by the tobacco companies. So uh, um, I think it's possible you're going to see that, um, and there have been efforts. I think uh, John Banzeff and Dick Daner have talked about uh, the obesity issue and, and trying to use litigation as a tool. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.